Father, we thank you for the opportunity this evening to study this portion of your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to convert gnosis, which is academic knowledge, into epinosis, which is beyond knowledge. It is that pneumatikos, that spiritual phenomenon that allows us to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that is the very purpose for which we are alive and breathing on this earth. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now last time we left off with the uh, sins of the tongue, and now we're going to have some concluding principles regarding the sins of the tongue. But first of all, this is March 17th. That means it's St. Patrick's Day, and there's a lot of myths surrounding St. Patrick's Day. But in fact, St. Patrick was a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a Christian. He was born in Britain. He was not born in Ireland. And he lived his days in Britain until he was about 16. And at the age of 16, legend has it that he was captured by some Irish pirates. And uh, he worked as a slave for them for some years as, an, uh, as a young man working as a slave under these Irish pirates. And he also went to Ireland with these pirates and stayed with them for years. And finally, he was released from slavery and he went back to Britain. But before he went back to Britain, which at that time was called Gaul, but today it would be England, when he went back to England, before he left Ireland, he made a promise that he would come back to that land. Now, Ireland was a place of pagans. There was no such thing as Christianity in Ireland at that time. They were just uh, pagan gods and pagan worship. And in uh, Britain, there was some Christianity in Britain. So he uh, studied at what would be comparable to a seminary, and he studied there. And then he fulfilled his promise and went back to Ireland. And he went from city to city, respecting the culture and the tribes, which is a wise thing to do, and at the same time gave the gospel all throughout Ireland. And by the time of his death, Ireland had gone from pagan to almost completely Christian. He was a great missionary, and that's why we celebrate this day, March 17th. Now, I know they flood the Savannah River with some type of green stuff, and people go out tonight and drink uh, some type of green beer, but this is, uh, this is all additions to what was uh, supposed to be an honor of a, of a great missionary, and that's what today is all about. And that's just a little bit of history for you. So now let's get to the concluding principles regarding the sins of the tongue and the sins of the tongue are, of course, gossip, maligning, and judging. And we started with this last time, and now we're going to go through these points. And it might seem a little arduous at first, uh, but we have to go through them, and then we'll move on to other things. Point one, the believer who is guilty of slandering, maligning, or judging others is a visible loser in the Christian way of life. This does not mean he loses his salvation. You cannot lose your salvation. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Christ died once and for all for all of us. Therefore, if you believe in Christ, you are sealed into his family and you are called royal family and you cannot get out. But you can be a loser in the Christian way of life. So point one, if you're one of these people who is guilty of slandering, maligning, and judging others all the time, then you are a visible loser in the Christian way of life. Point two, you cannot be occupied with the sins and failures of others and at the same time be occupied with Christ. In other words, get your eyes off of people. You know, most churches around here today are people-oriented. Uh, they have basketball groups or they have a the uh, divorced meeting and then the single people meet and then the married people meet, all for social life. And social life is fine, but church is designed to where you learn the Word of God and uh, social life is just an extra. It's something that you have on the side, which is, which is normal, but when you're in church, it's not a country club. It shouldn't be. It should be a place where you learn the Word of God. So you cannot be occupied with the sins and failures of others and at the same time be occupied with Christ. And that's what happens in many churches 
people get their eyes on people and they start gossiping about each other and their sins when it's none of your business what other people do in their lives. They have privacy. Do you know we are all priests when we believe in Christ? That's as per 1 Peter 2.5 and 1 Peter 2.9. We are a kingdom of priests. And that means we have privacy. And we have the privacy of our priesthood. And therefore, we have no right to judge other people. And that's made clear in the Bible. And if you want to get um, it on tape, last week I talked, or yesterday and the day before, I talked all about that. And eventually, I don't think we have any left. There might be some. Uh, I might be able to get us some. But uh, probably Sunday I'll have a whole big new stack of tapes over there of when I went through lessons 1 through 18. Point 3. All believers sin after salvation. But each believer has the privacy to utilize 1 John 1, nine. And 1 John 1, nine states, If we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. So you should be left alone concerning your sins because your sins are between you and the Lord and they're between you and no one else. And that's the way Scripture says it should be and that's the way it should be. Point four, all believers sin after salvation. And therefore, all punishment related to those sins should be left in the hands of the Lord. And we should not interfere with the Lord in judging. Jesus Christ, as we studied, is the supreme judge. We have no right to judge. When we start judging other people, we're saying, get out of the way, Lord, I can handle this person. And you can't. That's not your business. And if you try it, the Lord will smack you down because he'll say, this is my job. Why are you trying to take over my job? And that's what many Christians try to do today. They try to act like little Hitlers, or they try to think they're like little Jesus Christ running around. But there's one Jesus Christ, and he's the judge, and we are not. We are to live our own unique spiritual life in privacy. So judging other believers interferes with the judgment and the punitive action from God, and that's point five. Judging other believers interferes with the judgment and punitive action from God. Point six, when believers are judged by other believers, this becomes a source of discouragement and frustration to the victim, and it often results in irritation and loss of motivation for the person to continue to learn the plan of God. And that's what happens in many churches. People uh, that start gossiping about maybe there's a new member of the church and they do something that you don't like, so you gossip about it. Well, that new member of the church gets irritated and walks out the door, as he should. And he gets discouraged, and therefore, uh, no wonder he walks out the door. You people aren't giving good news. All you're doing is nitpicking. And what people need is the good news, which is the gospel of Christ. So you will be judged for putting a stumbling block and putting a discouragement in the path of a fellow believer. And if you discourage a fellow believer, then woe to you, because God is about to punish you severely, because uh, he wants, we are all royal family of God, and he wants all of us to grow up spiritually. And, um, and believe me, that judgment will be <clears throat> severe. So point six, if you didn't get all of that down, when believers are judged by other believers, this becomes a source of discouragement and frustration to the victim. And it often results in irritation and loss of motivation to execute God's plan for their life. And if you are one of those to put a stumbling block in front of another believer, you will be judged by God for that. Point seven, Therefore, in the church age, and we haven't studied dispensations yet, but we live in the church age today. We do not live in the age of Israel, and we do not live under the Mosaic law. We live under a new law, and we are in the church age. Therefore, in the church age, the sins and failures of other believers must be left in the hands of the Lord for judgment and not in the hands of the self-righteous, arrogant, sinful man. Point eight. To interfere with the function of Jesus Christ as the supreme judge is to invite disaster upon yourself. Every time you judge a fellow believer, you're simply inviting disaster upon yourself. 
we have enough problems in our own lives that we need to straighten out without sticking our long proboscis, that's a nose, in other people's business. Point nine, when one believer condemns another believer, he is in a state of blasphemy for slander, maligning, gossiping, and judging. And this is tantamount to superseding the Lord as the Supreme Court judge in heaven. And the only exception to this principle is law enforcement. Law enforcement has a right to judge the individual in a criminal case, in theft, or in uh, drug abuse, or in uh, murder. The law has a right to come down on that, and the Lord has provided for that, and that's an exception. And that's why we have a court system, and that's absolutely bona fide, because this is what the Lord has delegated for criminality, but that's it. Everything else uh, that you gossip and malign about, and even if you gossip and malign about a criminal, that's not your business. What you should do is just leave it in the hands of the law. Uh, there's no place for vigilanteism, in, uh, especially in the Christian way of life. Let the law handle the wrongdoer. Point 10. If believers were more concerned about learning the Word of God, they would be less concerned about sticking their nose and everyone else's business. So if people uh, wanted to learn the Word of God, um, if they're spending all their time with their nose stuck in everybody's business, they're not learning the Word of God. And if you want to learn the Word of God, then you come here and you come in privacy. And I hope all of you feel comfortable here and nobody's gossiping about you. And that's because you need to learn the Word of God. And that's the most important thing in your life, or it should be. Point 11. And this is 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12. And if you want to turn there, you may. 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12. And this is a summing up of what uh, I have been teaching regarding the sins of the tongue. And this is what it says in 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12. And this is a corrected translation straight from the Greek. And this is where it says... To sum it all up, let us all live in harmony, sympathetic, love as fellow Christians, be compassionate and humble, not returning evil for evil, insult for insult, but blessing. Because to this you were called that you might inherit blessing. For whoever would love long life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And let him turn away from evil and produce good of intrinsic value. Let him seek prosperity and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears listen to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And those who do evil are those who gossip, malign, and judge. And look where it says, and his ears listen to their prayers. The, the ears of the Lord listens to the prayers of those who stay away from gossip, maligning, and judging. In fact, the ears of the Lord listens to those who are in fellowship. And if you're gossip and maligning and judging, your prayers never go as high as this ceiling. Never! What you need to be is filled with God, the Holy Spirit. And then you will have a wonderful prayer life. And through prayer, many wonderful things can happen if you're a prayer warrior. And uh, things can happen that you would never think could happen. And we'll get to prayer and the function of prayer later as part of this basic series. So you can see this basic series is going to take quite a while. But uh, uh, that's why I'm adding classes so that we can get through it and move on to verse-by-verse verse Matthew and verse-by-verse verse Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, and go through the entire New Testament, and then we'll see what happens after that. Uh, and that might take years and years and years. So turn your Bibles to James 3.2. I want to show you something from James 3.2. And this is talking about spiritual maturity. And there is a definite sign that when you reach spiritual maturity. People who avoid the sins of the tongue, that's a good sign that they are spiritually mature. And this is found in James 3.2. And I have the corrected translation 
from the Greek written here, and I'm, I don't know exactly what your Bible says. It's it's pretty close. I think I looked it up in the New King James, and it's pretty close. And it says, For we all commit many sins. If someone does not commit sins of the tongue, the same is a mature believer, able to control the entire body. What this is saying is if you can control the tongue, you're able to control your entire body. You're a mature believer. You have control over your vessel, your body. You are filled with God the Holy Spirit in your vessel. And we do commit sins. All of us commit sins. And it says, for we all commit many sins. And that's what James tells us. And that is correct. We as believers commit many sins. But then he goes on to say, but if someone does not commit sins of the tongue, the same is a mature believer. In other words, uh, you may sin in other ways, but and uh, you will re rebound. That means use First John one nine. As soon as you sin, and you rebound, and you remain filled with God the Holy Spirit, and you take in the Word of God, and you become mature. And when that occurs, uh, you notice something when you get to spiritual maturity, and that is that you uh, don't wag your tongue so much about other people. And that's a fact. And if you catch yourself wagging your tongue all the time, you're not mature yet. And in fact, we studied uh, triple compound discipline. And that was in the last message. And if you are interested in that, you can get it on an MP3. And I hope to have that available Sunday. And I might have some in the car uh, right now. They don't have the pretty label on it, but that doesn't matter. The content's the same. All right. Let's continue uh, with this. Now, we just finished with the uh, sins of the tongue, but we're going to see how verbal sins uh, with regard to destroying a congregation. Verbal sins can definitely destroy a church in a, in a, in a New York minute. And uh, we'll see this uh, in 2 Timothy 2.15. In 2 Timothy 2.15. Now, Timothy was a, a young man. He was a young pastor, and he was getting run over by the ladies in the church, and people were gossiping about poor Timothy all the time. And so the Apostle Paul wrote Timothy two letters to instruct him on how to deal with the people in the Corinthian church. And the Corinthians were a handful, and you had to be tough with these types of people, or they would never understand what you were trying to say. But Timothy was just a nice fellow, and he didn't like conflict, and so they ran right over him. So then the Apostle Paul had to write him a letter and instruct him on what to do. So in 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Be motivated to present... Now this is the corrected translation. Be motivated to present yourself approved by God, a person evaluated by God as a hero. Now that is a, a spiritual hero, a spiritually mature person, a person who has, as the Greek says, reached pleroma to theu, and that means the fullness of blessing of God. Not needing to be ashamed. And that means that the evaluation throne of Christ, and that occurs during the tribulation, we will all be resurrected before our Lord and we will be evaluated by our Lord. And, and the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy how not to be ashamed when he reaches that point. Handling accurately the word of truth, and that's uh, the word of God, but avoid profane chatter because those occupied with it will stray further and further into ungodliness. What is ungodliness? Well, we know godliness in the scripture uh, is the Greek word eusebia, and that Greek word eusebia is, is reference to the unique spiritual life. Now, ungodliness means you're not in the spiritual life. You're out of fellowship, and as we studied uh, last night, uh, Jesus Christ is knocking at your door, and that means divine discipline. He warns you first with a light knock, and then he hits harder with, uh, by giving you a little more pain until you wake up and utilize 1 John 1, 9 and name your sins. And it's as simple as that. And so we continue, but avoid profane chatter because those occupied with it will stray further and further into ungodliness, that is, away from the spiritual life, and what happens is they go into perpetual 
carnality. And what's carnality? You're controlled by your old sin nature. And we noted from Romans that within the members of our body is the old sin nature. We were born with an old sin nature. In fact, when we were conceived, we were conceived uh, with the male chromosomes which carry the old sin nature. And at birth, that is when it becomes active in us. It's dormant in the womb because that would mean a woman would have to have two sin natures while she's pregnant. And while it may seem so, it's not true. She only has one sin nature. And then uh, when the lady has the baby, then that uh, baby has the sin nature become active. So we will continue. And their message will spread its infection like gangrene. And that is the corrected translation. And I don't... Somebody tell me what uh, your English translation says. So it did say gangrene. Well, how about that? That's a good translation. That's what it is. And their message will it spread its infection like gangrene. And that happens... In churches, it spreads like gangrene, and suddenly, in a church, you have a bunch of sick weirdos gossiping about each other, and that's all the church turns into, and they learn nothing of the Word of God, and that's a sad thing. So, we will continue, uh, and then he goes on to say, uh, like Hymenius uh, and Philetus are in this group, and the Apostle Paul is naming these people by name because... He's telling, as a pastor, he's telling Timothy, kick these people out of your church or they will destroy your church. Timothy's not judging anybody, neither is Paul. But when, you, when you're in authority as a pastor or as a deacon, you have the authority when you spot a troublemaker to kick them out because if you don't, uh, they will cause trouble in the church and then uh, there'll be uh, dissent amongst each other. And that's not the way the church should function. And that's uh, what he does here, and what what it says by and their message will spread uh, its infection like gangrene. Well, in the Middle Ages, they did not have sanitation as we do today. Uh, we have toilets, and, and all of the nastiness goes in, un, under the ground into the uh, sewer or into the uh, the thing in the backyard. I'm having a Septic tank. There you go. It goes into the septic tank. Now, in the Middle Ages, uh, they all they had was a pot, and they would sit it by their bed, and, and they were kind of crude about it, and they would go to the bathroom, and then uh, they would walk over to the window when they were through and toss it out. And we're talking busy city streets. They would just toss it out, and there's a sidewalk, and their dung would fall on the sidewalk. And that's where chivalry came from, because if you were dating a lady, the man would always have to walk on the inside along the street. So in case some woman threw the uh, crap out of the window, it would fall on the man and not the woman. And so they would walk down the street holding hands, and he would take the crap for her. And, that's <laughs> and sometimes that's the way it is in marriage. That was a joke. Don't take it personally. <laughs> and so this would spread around. They would, in other words, this would get spread around just by slinging it out. And it spreads around in a church. Bitterness, vindictiveness, uh, implacability. All of these sins spread around just as if you're throwing, throwing it out there. And then everybody starts stinking with this sin. And it is sin. And this is what we will avoid in this church. Uh, we don't want to be uh, smelling like that. So it is the solemn duty of a pastor to warn and guard against the evil of gossip maligning and mischief making. And in Job 15.35, you can turn to it if you wish, but I'm just going to uh, tell you what it says real quick. In Job 15.35, it says, They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. Therefore, their mind prepares deception. Now, this is talking about the mischief maker. And in many churches, there are mischief makers. In the workplace, there are mischief makers. People who try to get ahead by causing mischief. And uh, this is a part of sin. It's a part of the old sin nature. 
And let's get a diff definition of mischief. And if you want to write it down, that's fine. I'll try to go a little slower for you. Mischief. Mischief is the conduct or action resulting in harm, trouble, schism, and schism is spelled S-C-H-I-S-M, especially against legitimate authority. A mischief maker is anti-legitimate authority. Mischief, the conduct or action resulting in harm, trouble, schism, especially against legitimate authority. Point one. Mischief makers in the local church use attractiveness and personality resources to acquire approbation and power. And we noted that approbation means approval. They get approval from people, excuse me, and from that approval they receive power. And for the first time, a lot of people in churches start to feel as if they're powerful because they get all the approval from all these people patting them on the back and telling them how great they are when in fact they're not great at all. And so uh, they become mischief makers. Then they use this power to distract others and to turn them away from the Word of God. They t if a pastor's up teaching the Word of God, the mischief maker will say, oh, you don't need to listen to that. Come listen to me. I got something better to tell you. And yet they've probably done uh, about zero study. But this is what the mischief maker does. And the mischief makers stand between people who are attracted to them and the Word of God that is being taught from the pulpit. So they uh, stand between these people and they, make, and they force these people to make a choice. Do these people still want to be your friend or are they still going to listen to the pastor? And that's how churches split. Now this church is so small, if it split, I would be shocked. <laughs> but that's how it splits. All right. Psalm 7, 14 through 16. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with the small church. We're going to be a lean, mean, spiritual machine is what we're going to do. We're going to stuff this doctrine in our souls, and we're going to grow up spiritually, and we're going to go to play Roma to Theu, as it says in the Greek, and uh, we're going to have a wonderful time doing it. And if it has to be uh, 7, 8, 11 people the whole time, well, that's better. At least we won't be having schisms, as it says in the Bible. Psalm 7, 14, 16. And this is talking about the mischief maker as well. Behold, he or she is pregnant with evil, and she or he conceives mischief and gives birth to delusion. And delusion uh, we studied uh, last night. And under delusion, I showed you the feet of clay. Let's glance at that if it's up here. I showed you the feet of clay, and uh, Dallas drew all these pretty pictures so that you would understand it. So this is delusion right here in Psalms. Behold, he or she is pregnant with evil, and, and he or she conceives mischief and gives birth to delusion, or, Ill, or excuse me, uh, yeah, dis, disillusion, and that means disillusionment. So what happens in disillusionment, and I know you've heard this, but it's always good to review. All right. Disillusionment. Now up there it says iconoclastic arrogance, and the root word is icon. It means you, may, you create an idol out of this person. The arrogant believer down here creates an idol out of this person. And then he sees his feet of clay. This guy commits a sin, and he sees it. Of course he commits a sin. We all do, as per 1 John 1, 1.8 through 1 John 1.10. And so uh, he sees this person commit a sin, and he's created this idol, and then all of a sudden, he's what's called disillusioned. And he's disillusioned by this person. Now, he put this person on a pedestal. That person didn't want to be on a pedestal, but the arrogant believer put him on a pedestal. And then suddenly, when the arrogant believer sees that that person has sinned, he, becomes, he puts himself up here, and the idol that he created, he starts to destroy through gossip, maligning, and judging, and all of that. And that's because he's disillusioned. He's disillusioned by this person. He thought this person was a wonderful person, and now suddenly he's, he feels let down by this person, so he tries to destroy the idol. And that's arrogance because he didn't want to be an idol to start with, and now he's being destroyed, and he never wanted to be the idol to start with, and so he's receiving all of this um, grief when he didn't even want to be an idol. And then what happens, 
the arrogant believer looks around and says, "You know what? Everybody's a sinner," and he's right. But then he says, "You know, I don't." I he he starts to think. Some people actually think to themselves, "Well, I don't sin anymore," and that's a lie. Everybody sins. First John one eight and First John one ten will tell you you're a liar if you think you're without sin. And so the arrogant believer up here says, "Well, I don't sin like other people." And so he finds people down here who have the same trend of the sin nature, and he seeks approval to these people here, and then he receives re approval, and he makes himself an idol, and that's how whole churches get started, and that's what we studied the other night, and that's by way of review. So uh, that was point four, and now we're going to switch gears, and we are finished with the sins of the tongue. It took a while to get through all of that, and today we're finished with the sins of the tongue, but we're moving on to a different subject altogether, and that would be the doctrine of the sin face-to-face -face with death. And there is a sin face-to-face -face with death, but it's not a sin. It's a, it's a living in perpetual carnality, and we will see that. And the, and the sin face-to-face -face with death is found in Scripture, and it's found in 1 John 5.16. And if you want to turn to 1 John 5.16, that would be fine, because we're probably going to be uh, sticking with this verse for a little while. We won't be jumping around like we were with the sins of the tongue, because with the sins of the tongue, there were so many verses on it that we had to cover all of them. And 1 John 5.16, and this is the corrected translation from the Greek. I got this corrected translation from uh, Colonel R.B. Thiem, Jr., who is uh, the expert in the Greek language. I know very little Greek or Hebrew, but maybe uh, one day I can uh, study up on that. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin not face to face with death, he shall ask, and God the Father will give life to him, who does not sin face to face with death. There is a sin face to face with death. I do not say that he should ask concerning this category. Now this is uh, going to be a very difficult passage for me to explain because it would seem like uh, you would have to actually judge people in order to uh, do this. But let me try to explain it. And uh, so first of all, as a part of exegesis from the Greek, the literal meaning of the Greek prep preposition pros, that's P-R-O-S, plus the accusative of relationship means face to face with death. Your Bible might say the uh, um, sin unto death. Well, that's okay, but uh, sin unto death, really, I can't get a meaning of what does that mean, sin unto death. Uh, so, but idiomatically, from the Greek, it, it can be translated the sin terminating with death. And so the translation, as I said, unto death is basically meaningless and it would leave you confused concerning what the actual meaning is. And so what is this uh, sin face-to-face -face with death? Does that mean you can uh, commit a, a specific sin and uh, suddenly you just drop dead? No, that is not what it's saying at all. The sin face-to-face -face with death occurs only when the believer and the Lord Jesus Christ lives in perpetual carnality. That means you allow the old sin nature within the members of your body to control your soul all the time. And you never utilize 1 John 1, 9, which says, name your sins. And if you name your sins, you're forgiven. It says God is faithful to forgive you. And he's faithful, which means he'll do it every time. He'll never get tired of hearing you say, I've committed this and I've committed that. He is God. He is faithful. He will not. And in fact, we are commanded to do so in 1 John 1, 9. And that's how we remain filled with God the Holy Spirit. And being filled with God the Holy Spirit, we are in no danger of the sin face to face with death. And when we sin and then rebound, we are not in danger of the sin face to face with death. But if we sin and we never utilize 1 John 1, 9, we will at some point be in danger of the face to face with death. So, uh, for example, you could live under the antinomian uh, stage that would be lascivious and never rebound, and we've studied this. And uh, if you never rebound, eventually God will take you out as per uh, 1 John 5.16. Or you could li live under the legalistic stage where you judge everybody all the time, and eventually God will take you out then. And if you're a believer, 
when you die this sin face to face with death, you automatically go to heaven to a place of no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more death. But on the earth, God punishes His children, and that's just the way it works. So that thus we see the importance of 1 John 1, 9, because if you do not keep short accounts on your sin nature, and if you do not keep short accounts on your sins through the utilization of 1 John 1, 9, uh, you're in danger of, uh, first of all, uh, divine discipline in the lighter stage, and then intensive discipline, and then finally, uh, the third one, uh, dying discipline. So we see in the verse... Now, this is where it gets complicated to where I'm trying to explain something to you. We see in the verse that it says, You are not to pray for believers who are dying to sin face to face with death. However, you can pray for others as long as they have not committed the sin face to face with death. So what is this verse telling us? This verse is telling you that the only effectual prayer you will have for Christians who are ill are the prayers for Christians who are living within the unique spiritual life. Those people who are uh, moving ahead with doctrine, filled with God the Holy Spirit, and yes, they sin, we all sin, but you, you know they're interested in the Word, positive toward the Word, and those people you can pray for, and those people you should pray for, and this is concerning when they are ill or sick, and your prayers will be effectual. Uh, so you, you say to yourself, uh, well, how do I determine if someone is dying the sin face to face with death? Wouldn't I have to uh, judge that person? But we have to understand that there's a difference between discernment and judgment. In judging, there's always a sinful motivation behind it. When you judge somebody, uh, you might be jealous of somebody, and that's why you judge them. Or you might hate somebody, and that's why you judge them. But in discernment, there is no evil motivation behind it. You're simply making discernment. For example, in the Bible, it tells us to separate from certain types of people. Now, you're not judging that person when you separate from them. You're simply using discernment. And why? Because if you did not separate from that person, that person would drag you down with them. For example, if they're in the legalism, which means they're in self-righteousness and they gossip and malign all the time, if you constantly hang around them, you will get dragged into that. And so it takes discernment. And that doesn't mean you're judging them. That doesn't mean you go up to their face and say, you're a creep. You just separate mentally from them and go about your own way. So it's not judging. It's discernment. And there's a difference. And, and the difference is uh, there's a fine line there, and that's why it's, it's so hard to teach this. But just remember that in judging, there is always a sinful motivation behind judging. Like I said, if you're jealous, you'll judge, or if you're angry, you will judge. However, in discernment, there is no mental attitude sin behind discernment. And, uh, for example, today I can make the discernment that most believers around the country don't care for the Word of God. Now, I'm not judging them all. I'm making a discernment. I discern that uh, from what I see uh, through perception. I, if I didn't see that, I wouldn't have a brain. So you have to have discernment and discernment. We'll study discernment in more detail as part of the basic series because the Word of God will give you discernment. So, uh, but let me issue a, a, a caveat, and that means a warning. Let me issue a warning concerning 1 John 5.16. When you see someone die, never ever be guilty of, of, of saying to anyone, you might know it, but never say to anyone, well, that person died to sin unto death. That person, that if he has, he's went through some horrible times and the Lord has judged him and the Lord has taken care of that person, don't mention it. You'll, you'll get punished if you do. Don't mention it. Even if you know it, don't say a word about it. Never, ever do anything like that because punishment's involved with that. The only purpose for 1 John 5.16 and why he's telling us this is because he's trying to teach us how to pray and when to pray and who to pray for and who not to pray for. And it takes a little bit of spiritual wisdom to actually understand uh, 1 John 5.16. And, uh, and, and that's about the best way right now. Uh, we'll go over this again in the future, but right now this seems to be the best way I can explain this. And I was struggling with this all day trying to figure out exactly how to explain this because it is a very sensitive, sensitive subject. 
All right, so let's take some points down. Point one, the sin face to face with death means you are living in continuous sin without utilization of 1 John 1, 9. In other words, you never take responsibility for your sins. And how do you take responsibility for your sins? You name them to God. That's how you take responsibility for sins. Now, the problem with most people is that they uh, justify their sins. Uh, they say, well, that person deserved to be gossiped about. I'm right. I have a right to say that about that person. So instead of naming that sin to God, you don't even acknowledge it as a sin, and you justify it. And then you move through the uh, three cogwheels, which we studied, self-justification, self-deception, and self-absorption. Point two, the sin face-to-face -face with death is maximum divine discipline from the integrity of God. And it is the highest form of disgrace that can occur to the believer on this earth. Now, once they die as a believer, they go straight to heaven. There's no such thing as purgatory. You go to heaven. All suffering that you suffer is on the earth. And if you've believed in Christ, you're going to heaven, no matter how you've lived your life after salvation. And you say, how is that? That's because the Lord Jesus Christ was judged for all of our sins. And not our sins only, but for the sins of the entire world he was judged. And to say that we can lose our salvation is to say that Jesus Christ did not do enough on the cross. And I'm here to tell you he suffered and suffered and suffered and he did do enough. And that's why we have salvation and that's called grace. And that's not taught very often, but it should be. Point, what point am I on now? Point three, divine discipline results from the believer using his own volition, that means his own decisions, to create his own failures in life after salvation. After salvation, we have a spiritual life to live, and you will have failures. So divine discipline results from the believer using his own volition to create his own failures in life after salvation. Point four, the sin face to face with death is described also in Psalm seven fourteen through sixteen. Psalm seven fourteen through sixteen. And this is where it says Behold, he shall have labor pains of vanity. Now that's warning discipline. That's God standing outside the door as it says in Revelation chapter two and knocking like this. Warning discipline. Let me in to dine with you. Let's have fellowship. In other words, use first John one nine. Because he has become pregnant with frustration. Therefore he has given birth to a life of deceit. So first of all it starts out as mental attitude sins, and then it gives birth to verbal sins, and he has a life of deceit and then begins the intensified discipline where he starts knocking like that and you're under a lot of pain and a lot of pressure. And if you still do not use 1 John 1, 9, it continues and says, He dug a grave. That means he finally faced the sin face to face with death. He explored it. And that means he experienced the warning and intensive discipline first. You see, God warns you first. He's just not going to smite you down dead. He's going to warn you because God is just and fair and he warns you first. So uh, this fellow that uh, Psalms is talking about actually explored the fact that he was being disciplined, but he was so stubborn he wouldn't admit it. So he explored it and he still died. And that's why it says, Therefore he has fallen into the ditch which he himself has constructed. His frustration will return on his own head. The sin face to face with death does not come all at once, but it comes in, in seg segments. Excuse me. <clears throat> Point five. Failure to use 1 John 1, 9 results in pe perpetual carnality. That means continuous. Perpetual means continuous. And perpetual carnality results in First, warning discipline, then intensive discipline, and then if you continue to fail to use 1 John 1, 9, you will die the sin face to face with death. 
and that's how serious this spiritual life is. Point six, the sin face to face with death is maximum divine discipline. It would be the most painful experience in life and there's no alleviation for it. It implies loss of reward and blessing and ashamedness at the Bema, and that is the evaluation throne of Christ when we are all evaluated before our Lord. And we will be evaluated and he will in essence say, what did you do with the unique spiritual life and if you have nothing to answer for it, except that you gossiped all the time, then you will be ashamed. You'll be in heaven and you'll be happy, but at the same time, you'll be ashamed before our Lord. And that's an oxymoron, or you could call it a paradox as well. But that's the oxymoron of heaven, the ultimate oxymoron. But you will be happy to be in heaven instead of hell, I'll tell you that much. So, let's take a look at four categories of death. There are four categories of death. And the last category is not actually death, uh, but we do depart from the earth in the fourth category. So point one, under the four categories of death, we have dying grace. Now, dying grace is for the mature believer or the advancing believer, the believer who is moving to the high ground, following the colors, learning the word of God. Like David said, on thy word I meditate both day and night. And for the person who does that, he's mature, he's advancing. And, and, and when he dies, he will have the greatest blessing of this life because it's directly related to and, and, it, and it will only be exceeded by the rewards we receive at Bema. Uh, but for the person who is uh, in dying grace, he's not afraid to die, he's not scared. And in fact, it's a very peaceful thing when you pass on from uh, this world and move into heaven. And he's not scared at all. And there are many verses uh, dealing with that. Psalms 116.15 talks about dying grace. And this is where it says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Or you could see Philippians 1.21 where it says, and this is elliptical. There is no verb. In your, in your English Bible, there is a verb. But it's elliptical because it's trying to make a point. And it says, for me, living Christ, dying prophet. And that's what Philippians 1.21 says. Your Bible says, for me, living is Christ and dying is prophet. And that makes more sense to our English language. But we're trying, I'm trying to show you here the excitement of the Apostle Paul. And that's why he left out the verb. He, he was so excited when he was writing this down. He just completely left out the verbs to show emphasis on the fact that he was not at all scared of death. In fact, knew that death means profit for the believer, especially the mature believer. Point two, there have been a few cases of transfer to heaven apart from death. And, uh, and, and an example of this would be Enoch. And that's found in Hebrews 11.5 and 2 Kings 2.11-12. through 12. So there have been some cases where God just suddenly uh, takes you on up to heaven. But that's Old Testament, and that does not happen today. Not yet, anyway. We'll get to that. Point three, we have the sin face to face with death, and that's the third category. And this is disciplinary death given to believers who refuse to execute the spiritual life. And anyone who commits suicide has died the sin face to face with death. But if you commit suicide and you believed in Christ, you still go to heaven and you say, how in the world do you know that? Well, we studied that when we studied King Saul who fell on his own sword and that very day went to see Samuel. And where was Samuel? Heaven. So if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, you're saved. Even if you blow your brains out and you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved. Why? Because Christ died as a substitute for that sin as well. He died as a substitute for all sins except one, and that is the rejection of him. Christ did not die for the rejection of him. So if you reject Christ, you will go to hell. And that's as simple as I can put it. And so the sin face to face with death, point three, this is disciplinary death given to believers who refuse to execute the spiritual life. Anyone who commits suicide has died the sin face to face with death because they have just committed the ultimate act of self 
absorption. And point four, and this will be the last point for tonight, and I'll wrap it up, and this is the fourth uh, category of death, but this is not actually death. This is called ex anastasis, and that's the exit resurrection. So point four is the exit resurrection, and this occurs at the end of the church age in which all of us will go to meet the Lord in the air. And that's the way it goes. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you are here today without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, you do have hope. And Scripture throughout Scripture tells you that you do have hope. John 3.15 says that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. John 3.16, For God loved the world so much that He gave His uniquely born Son so that whosoever believes in Him shall never perish but have eternal life. And John 3.18, He who believes in Him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the unique person of the Son of God. And John 3.36, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abides on him. So you have the chance right now, inaudibly, in your own mind, your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. That gives you privacy to make your own decision. You can either accept Jesus Christ or reject him. That's your choice. But this may be the last day that you're alive on this earth, and you never get another chance after death. If you're, if you're alive, you have the chance right now to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and if you say, Father, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the moment of your salvation. And uh, so therefore, Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this evening to study your word. And may God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the things which we have studied. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. <laughs>